Welcome to Writers Read. Aren't we lucky to get together again and hear some writers read? But you know the routine. Let's start with the poem written by Paul Liebank. Write, write, write. Write, write, write. Until you get it right. Until you get it right. Then read aloud. Then read aloud. You'll draw a crowd. You'll draw a crowd. And bring us great delight. And bring us great delight. And first of all, we're going to hear Ina Bray. And Ina, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for all the memories you've shared with us, for all the stories about those memories. I feel our whole community has treasured you sharing that, especially at this time, I need to say. So thank you, Ina, from all of us. Thank you. And uh, this week, I wrote to the readers, who are also writers, <laughs> and asked them this question. I said, do you have a memory of when you first read something? Or do you have an early memory of somebody reading to you? So, Ina, what is your memory? My memory? <clears throat> well, memory, my beginning is rather complex in that mm. area. Um, because I learned how to read very, very early. Um, reading in this way is really very simple. I mean, I brought a sample. You read every letter just as it is written. Ishur ateyobe. No big deal. If I tell you how to read it, you won't be able to do it. So as a little child, I was before four years old, I could already put all those letters together and I could read. Oh my. I might not have understood what I'm reading, but nevertheless, I could, I could read. Then, early in my childhood, I was a little over four years old, I remember that. Oh. Suddenly, that part of Lithuania became German. It was annexed by Germany, and everything became German. From our neighbors, oh. because the Lithuanians were kicked out, most of them, to the language, to the administration, to the flags, <clears throat> Nazi flags all around us. Everything was German. All the Lithuanian books were taken away. I mean, they, mm. were, they were now dangerous. So things began to be German. I couldn't read because now everything that I saw was in this script. And, you know, it's totally oh, different my. than the Latin script. So my parents didn't speak German for all practical purposes. I didn't speak German at four years old. Um, so it took a while in school, which was German, of course, that I began to read. This says, invest in nichts Neues, meaning nothing new on the Western Front. This, this book was published in 1928. Oh. So it's, it's an oldie. It's an oldie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my. Uh, so, you know, when did I start reading? Hard to tell. And then, of course, English took another quite a few years before yeah. I learned English and before I learned how to read this impossible language. Oh, oh <laughs> English. So, uh, but, so that was my That's beginning. That's beginning. Reading. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. That was an amazing story. I didn't think of needing to read two different languages <laughs> by the age yeah. of four. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Well, yeah, I oh, didn't, but then, my. Yeah. Okay. It worked eventually. It worked out. Everything worked out. I'm still here. You. Are. I'm still here. Bravo. So nothing. Bravo. Nothing ended. Oh. Yeah. I will read the poem. I am so sorry. So, I think we're going to continue now, mm -hmm. and you may read. Tell us what you're reading today. What I'm reading, um, this is now in Canada. This is now years later. This is in the mid '60s. Okay. Um, and I wanted to to bring a story, and I, I call it the, the subtitle of my um, story is "Nothing Is as It Seems," because here we are in Canada, in this wonderful country in British Columbia. My husband was teaching, and I'll talk about it. Uh, teaching at the university there, and 
yet there were things happening that were life-threatening. And so yeah. I want to talk about I want to I wrote a story about it, how I was um, directly involved in it unknowingly. Oh my. So I'm looking forward to this. This is a story. The story I call The Duke of War and I or nothing is as it seems. In the mid-1960s, my husband accepted a teaching position at the University of British Columbia, and we moved to Vancouver. Many surprises awaited us in this new country, but none more bizarre than the actions of the Sons of Freedom, or Freedomites, the most radical offshoot of the Duke of Wars. In the United States, the, to the general public, the word Dukabor means next to nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, north of the border, however, particularly in British Columbia and Saskatchewan, every Canadian can tell you stories about them. Stories laced with intense opinions, of course. Mm -hmm. The Dukabors are Russian-speaking religious dissenters, pacifists, who believe in the supreme, uh, supreme authority of the inner voice and the law of God surpassing the law of the state. Their origins in Russia date to somewhere in the 17th or 18th century. In their country, in Russia, for generations they suffered extreme oppression, particularly because of their refusal to serve in the military. Then in the late 19, uh, 1800s, Canada offered a most welcome refuge. Mm. To help populate the vast Canadian territories, Queen Victoria invited immigration with enticing promises of religious freedom, free land for cultivation, no taxes, no serving in the military, no schooling for the children, and there were other inducements. So of course the Duke of course eagerly accepted and over the following decades, thousands immigrated. In 1898-99 alone, more than 7,500 arrived on a ship chartered by Leo Tolstoy. It must have been a big ship. <clears throat> and British and American Quakers. Eventually, they settled in Saskatchewan and the, uh, and the southern part of British Columbia. And by adhering to the credo, toil, and peaceful life, they thrived economically. But in the 20th century, Queen Victoria, of course, promises could no longer be kept. The imposition of national policies of compulsory education, registration of marriage, birth and death, registration of land, or forfeiture thereof, military service, citizenship, taxation, and so much more, began to undermine the basic tenets of the group. Some adjusted to varying degrees, others went in different directions. By the 1920s, the Duke of Bors had evolved into three factions. Two remained peace-loving. The third, the Freedomites, resorted to arson, to bombings, violence, and even nudity to protest the increasing governmental attempts at integrating them into Canadian society particularly because of their violent acts of opposition, the Canadian government began to consider this most radical splinter group of the Duke of Bors a serious threat to nationhood. Rapidly they were, were evolving into a nation within a nation. By the mid-1960s, the confrontation and acts of terror reached their zenith. Of course, the media had a heyday covering bombings of trains destruction of railway bridges and other public installations, burning of schools and homes, and publishing photographs of nude, corpulent women parading in protest of some injustice or perceived injustice. A major terrorist attack occurred on March 7, 1962, when the Freedomites succeeded in toppling a huge power station tower in East Kootenay, uh, in British Columbia. That destruction disrupted the power supply for a vast region. Some thousand jobs were gone, and the financial cost to rebuild the tower was considerable. 
Numerous arrests of members of this group followed, with incarcerations in the Federal Agassiz Maximum Security Prison. The BC government had constructed this arson-proof prison specifically to hold the Freedomite Dukovors. Outside the prison gates, the Freedomites set up a tenement camp just for hours here, <laughs> more or less. Yeah. They intended to show their support for their imprisoned family members and friends who were sentenced from three to 12 years in prison. The camp continued on that site for many months and the papers mesmerized the public with stories that kept emerging. The prisoners, for example, communicated with the campers by a code that the Canadian authorities were not able to break. Prisoners allegedly softened their surroundings by growing plants on window, le uh, window ledges. It turned out huh, these plants were hallucinogenic. Even though our home in Vancouver was quite a distance from these bombings and terrorist attacks, the reports about them affected me. The shadow of my childhood during the years of World War II had not yet sufficiently lifted, and I watched with apprehension as a mini war raged in our free society, in this free society. The right to protest I understood, but to, to, to destroy property to the tune of millions of dollars with loss of lives, every few years setting your own house on fire with all your family's belongings inside, that's what the Duke of course had to do. That's what the religion told them to do. Exerting deadly vengeance against your own, because in your opinion, they stayed straight from the true faith. I wondered about this and more. Disrobing in public, particularly forcing children and teenagers also to dispose, expose themselves. How could they claim that these acts were wishes of God? That frightened me. I couldn't accept this. How far would these clashes reach, and where would they end? Was my own family safe? And how could I protect my two small daughters? One day, my mother called me from Los Angeles, asking me whether I could take some plant clippings to the male acquaintance of a close friend of hers. The friend was Lithuanian. We had already planned that my mother would come up the following weekend, and she would bring the clippings and so then she would bring the clippings, <clears throat> provided I could be the intermediary. Would she really smuggle live plants across the border for someone? It seemed like a puzzling request. Apparently an individual in Vancouver had asked her for these plants, which grew in profusion in Southern California. I don't forget their name, because they had some fierce medicinal powers able to cure cancer. As to who this man was, my mother didn't know much, except that he was Russian. And my mother's Lithuanian friend admired him greatly. This individual needed these plants for health reasons, so of course I said yes. Naturally, I assumed I would meet a person with a similar past, a World War II refugee like myself. My mother arrived, carrying with her a small bag of green succulent branches, as I remember, somewhat similar to aloe vera, but much smaller. She had the man's name, yes, and his phone number. After my, mom, my mother's visit, <clears throat> I called this mysterious individual, and to my relief, he offered to pick up the bundle at my house, with two small children on my hands. My days were rather confined, so I was very happy. A day or two later, he arrived. I opened the door. And there before me, bathed in golden sunshine, stood an elderly gentleman, average of height, probably in his late 60s, intelligent face under a floppy hat that he quickly removed. He greeted me in Russian. The choice of his words, his gentle smile, his, his gentle voice, his open smile, the twinkle in his eye, eyes, even his rumpled overcoat, they just beguiled me. Within these first few minutes on the threshold of my home, I thought I beheld a captivating grandfather, as one could only wish for one's children. Of course I invited him in, 
Immediately he noticed a Russian icon in the corner of the living room and quietly blessed my, my girls and me. We had rented a furnished house from a Russian professor who was on sabbatical leave. Over tea and freshly baked crumpets. We were in British Columbia after all. <laughs> we talked and we laughed and we shared. My daughters played around him and giggled at him. The little one climbed up on his lap and settled in. He charmed them thoroughly. He spoke no English, which didn't really surprise me. <clears throat> but then he revealed that his family had come to Canada many, many years ago. And that gave me mom momentary pause. He said his family had always lived in a small Russian community in eastern BC and had not particularly needed the English language. Well, that I understood. In Chicago, there are areas where Lithuanians for years have gotten along without English. My Russian was adequate for our stories. As the afternoon wore on and the crumpets began to disappear, in fragments he related to me his family's distrust of the Canadian government. Hmm. He talked about the Agassiz camp where he now lived. Just like his demeanor, his telling was soft and considerate, never shocking. It began to dawn on me that I was having a conversation, not with an immigrant trying to fit into Canadian mainstream, but with someone of quite a, the opposite persuasion. But I assumed he was just another grandfather who, in order to maintain solidarity, had joined the many others camped out by the prison. You must come visit us, he insisted in Russian. I promised to do so. I was most curious to see him in the setting of his family and to his experience his, this most controversial encampment. I mean, everybody knew about that encampment. Before he walked out the door, plants in hand, I grabbed a pair of my husband's shoes, some pieces of his clothing, as a farewell token of goodwill. He accepted them with much show of gratitude, his face beaming, and again made me promise that my family would come and visit him. Dark had fallen when my husband Jim came home. I couldn't wait to tell him in great detail who had visited us that afternoon. Jim was intrigued, but somewhat less so, when I told him where his shoes had no wonder to. <laughs> Nevertheless, <laughs> Nevertheless, we began to make plans how to drive out to visit my new Russian friend. Someone had given me the best-selling book, Terror in the Name of God, by Seema Holt. This one. And as you see, well illustrated. And there's much more of this inside the book. It still lay on the bookshelf, waiting to be opened. Out of curiosity, Jim decided to see whether he could find mention of the name of my friend. Yes, indeed. The name appeared quite prominently. Our hands began to shake as we turned the pages, reading extensive descriptions of his, ter his terrorist activities at various sites and over a number of years, railroad overpasses, electrical installations. He was a leader and exerted considerable influence over his group. Obviously, he was a master at his craft. <coughs> Days and weeks passed. We never mentioned, did mention the trek to the Agassiz camp. I don't remember consciously reaching that decision or even discussing it. That outing just moved into the background of our lives and then off our list. I would search for his name whenever headlines announced another terrorist act, but I never found it again. And now more than 50 years after that memorable afternoon, I no longer recall his name, but the impression that he made on me never left me. How many of us carry with us the dichotomy of a light and a dark personality, the kind and the cruel, the yin, and the Yang. I was ready to envelop this man into my family with no mother's intuition, 
alerting me to his true nature. But who was he really? The kindly old man in a halo of sunlight in whose lap my little girl snuggled? Or the ruthless, calculating individual who expertly blew up structures and possibly human beings and guided others to do the same? How could his religion have had such a strong hold on his mind to the degree that basic societal values could have become so completely perverted? And yet, and yet, these two extremes intersected within him. But with what ultimate results? And we, ordinary human beings, in our deepest core, who are we then? Are we then? Ina, you always open doors for us. You get my mind going, and I want to know more. Thank you so much. That was a gift to all of us. Thank you so much. Welcome to two people. Do we have a treat here? Because Connie has written some delightful writing, I'm sure. And Carol will be reading Connie's writing. So welcome to both of you, and so good to welcome you to Writer's Read. And here we go. The question for this section is, what is your earliest memory of reading? And Connie, why don't you start us off? Well, um, you remember that scene in The Miracle Worker where um, Patty uh, Duke, uh, as Helen Keller, makes the connection between uh, the code, the word, the object, the sound. And it's when she has her hand under a water pump and, um, and her teacher, Annie, is, teach, is signing water and it comes mm -hmm. back to her that shortly before she became deaf, she had learned the word for water, wah wah. And in that moment, it all comes together. It's that breakthrough moment, oh, yes. breakthrough moment which in a cartoon you'd have a light bulb over the head. <laughs> well, that I've always remembered that scene vividly because I had kind of a similar moment when I was three or four, and I'm sure we've all had this moment, um, when I was sitting at a table, a dining room kitchen table, and there was a bottle of milk with M-I-L-K on it, and it suddenly all came together to me that M-I-L-K was milk, was a name for the object and also the sound. Oh and th that was kind of my, yes. uh, my Helen Keller moment. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> putting it all together. That's a wonderful yeah. story. And right? after that, I, you know, I've been um, a compulsive reader all my life. Yes, you yes. have been. Oh, well, thank you. Carol, what is your memory of early, earliest reading? Did somebody read to you or did you read? I think I was about 40, and uh, <laughs> seriously, my dad was the one who read to me, and uh, uh, for some reason, because mother had a nice voice, but it must have been early, because they were simple little books, and it, after a while, it would delight him, because he would just stop talking with the story. He had read it over so many times, <laughs> and I'd just go right on and say all the words and repeat it. And so he thought that was really good. <laughs> That's a perfect story. So uh, it started in early days, and, and uh, it's continued in, if you, if you read and you like to read, I think that helps you write, because then you see the phrases that evoke emotions, exactly. just like with Connie. Yeah, exactly. Good point, Carol. Thank you so much. And Carol is going to read now Connie's writing. Connie, what is the focus of the writing? Uh, it's a children's book, a picture book, which is a challenge. They look really easy, but they're not. <laughs> what, as I discovered over years of writing and rewriting, um, I uh, made my living writing nonfiction for adults. And, and the conversion to writing for children um, is still, as you may notice, incomplete. Um, the thing about picture books is it's not just about the words, it's about the pictures 
that um, you don't yet have. So in effect, you're writing captions to prompt pictures mm. by an artist you've never met. Mm. <laughs> that's great. So you exactly. don't, for instance, describe a scene. Uh, that's the artist's job. You just describe the action and feelings oh, or, or whatever. Yes. Good advice, so, Connie. And that's one reason why they have so few words. Yeah. And, and in a sense, it's a, a pas de deux with an artist that you haven't met yet. <laughs> so, and um, it, it's still a work in progress. Okay. Uh, but it's focused on, inspired by Northwest Wildlife Park, oh, which wow. my, my parents, um, it had been our happy place growing up. And then um, as it became more and more valuable, um, it had started out as land that had been discarded by lumber companies and it had been logged and burned and it was pretty much trashed. And that's when my parents bought it for about $6 an acre. And um, some of it I think was only four fifty an acre. <laughs> um, but you know, over in the benign Northwest um, climate and the rain, after 40 years, it was a beautiful you know, second or third growth oh. forest. And at that point they decided uh, that they wanted to, in effect, return it to nature and um, populate it with uh, animals native to the Northwest and uh, have a park where children and families could come and enjoy and, and learn to appreciate uh, both the flora and fauna of the Northwest. Mm -hmm. So that's just Northwest Park. And the, um, the animal that caught the eye of um, the general public, even before the park opened, was a, um, a grumpy moose okay. who my father, who loved puns, called Chocolate Moose. <laughs> <laughs> and M O U S S E. And he was quite a character, and I thought a way to introduce oh. the public and children to the park was to use this iconic first moose. And so that's the genesis of the story. Oh, thank you. Looking forward to this. Carol, let's hear this story. I'm privileged, I feel privileged and honored that Connie has asked me to be your voice today. And it's her talent that I'm going to repeat to you. The title is A Home for Chocolate, the true life story of the orphan moose who made Northwest Trek famous. Deep in a northern forest, on a bed of moss and leaves, a moose was born. A cool breeze ruffled his fur. A large, warm tongue stroked him all over. Mother! He struggled to his feet and took his first gulp of a rich, warm milk. Mother and baby hid in the forest while he grew strong and steady. Then one day, when he was six weeks old, she walked away. Follow! Her eyes seemed to say, so follow he did, out into the wide, wonderful wilderness of the Canadian Rocky Mountains. There were meadows tall with tasty greens, marshes thick with tangy weeds, cool lakes and bubbling creeks, and everywhere shady woods to shelter in. Sometimes the pair met other moose. The calves would play, kicking up their heels, running in circles and splashing through puddles. The calf really loved puddles. But their wilderness home wasn't completely wild. Roads ran through it, and on those roads were cars and trucks. One day, a terrible thing happened. Screech! Thud! A speeding truck hit the calf's mother. Neil! Neil! He cried. But Mama didn't move. Another truck came. Strange, two-legged creatures got out. Poor little fellow, said one. Strong arms lifted the orphan calf into a truck. A human climbed in and held him close. With rumbles and bounces, the bewildered calf was carried away. Away from his wilderness home of meadows, wetlands, and trees. To a new world of fences and buildings and humans. With a jerk, the truck finally stopped. Strong arms set him down. Everything was strange. Packed earth underfoot, a roof overhead, and a confusion of smells. 
It was at the Wildlife Rehabilitation Center of the Calgary Zoo. A keeper bought a, brought a big bottle of milk. It didn't taste like his mother's, mm -hmm. but the orphan calf was too hungry to care. In time, he got used to his new home, joining other orphans in an outside pen. The keepers brought everything they needed, water, food pellets, and piles of leafy branches. Sometimes they brought bananas. The calf really liked bananas. Four years went by and the calf grew and grew and grew until by the fall of 1971, he had grown into a bull of 900 pounds with great spreading antlers and a restless spirit. Wild bulls his age were battling for mates, but a zoo built could a zoo bill, excuse me, could only shove the fence and pick fights with other animals. He's got to go, the Calgary keepers agreed. But where? They just couldn't turn the bull loose. Being zoo raised, he didn't know how to fight off bears, find food under ice and snow or avoid human hunters. There was only one thing to do, list the bull with the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, AZA, and HOPE. Luckily, that same fall, a special zoo was being born in Washington State, Northwest Trek Wildlife Park. It was the dream of a children's doctor, David Doc Hillier, and his wife Connie, who still lived there. Now grandparents, they dreamed of a public park where children and families could see native animals living naturally. So in 1971, they donated their land and their dream to the city of Tacoma. It was four years before Trek would open to the public. Zoos need all sorts of buildings, walkways, and exhibits. But Doc and Connie had already enclosed a huge 435-acre free-roaming area. Bison, elk, and deer were there. Other plant eaters like mountain goats and Rocky Mountain sheep were on their way. Still, something was missing. The largest member of the deer family, moose. Doc really wanted a moose. Happily, you saw the Aza listing. The Calgary Keepers were also happy. Northwest Trek, with its free roaming area, would be the ideal home for their restless bull. But first, the moose had to get there. Moving a full-grown bull with antlers five feet wide is a big job. First, the Calgary Keepers had to get him ready to travel. When the bull was resting, they shot a medicine dart into his shoulder. Ouch! Suddenly sleepy, he slumped to the ground. When he woke, his head felt lighter, 40 pounds lighter, and a metal tag was attached to his ear. At sunrise the next day, a truck with a horse trailer backed up to the gate of his pen. A keeper opened the trailer door. Bananas! The bull followed their smell right into the trailer, slammed with the door behind him. Three rumbling days, and 700 miles later, the trailer stopped. Stiff after his long ride, the moose staggered out to a corral. It was November 23, 1971, the first day of his new life. Easy boy, murmured Doc. He named the brown bull Chocolate Moose and visited him every day. Chocolate felt comfortable with the man and even let him put ointment onto an itchy patch. After two weeks in quarantine, Chocolate rode a bumpy truck into Trek's free roaming area. There in a holding pen, he began to earn the rhythm of life in his new home. The early morning circuit of a food truck. The look and smell of the animals roaming free and the gabble gabble of Canadian geese swooping home at dusk. Then, on the morning of New Year's Day, 1972, the world went crazy. 
Cars and trucks came rumbling and jouncing towards the pen. Excited humans crowded around. They came to see Trek's first moose set free. To Chalka, though, it was just a big, upsetting ruckus. The moment the gate opened, he dashed out past the people and disappeared into the trees. <laughs> Doc hoped the moose would enjoy his big new home. But after so many years in the care of humans, Chalka wasn't used to being on his own. He followed his keen nose to Doc and Connie's place. For days, Chalka hung around outside the fence surrounding the Hellier yard. He'd go back to the meadows when the morning feed truck made its rounds, but then he would return to spend time near humans. People heard about the backyard moose. They were curious. A reporter arrived with a photographer. Chocolate stood close to the fence next to Doc. Click, 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 with the camera. The story and photo appeared in newspapers all over the country. A radio station in New York City called to interview Doc. The leading television station in Seattle also aired a story. Chocolate was famous. And so, even though the park hadn't yet opened, was Northwest Trek. But Doc was worried. Chocolate wasn't supposed to be a pet. He was supposed to make himself at home in the free roaming area where park visitors would be able to see him. Then one day, big trouble. Chocolate found a weak spot in the fence. Moose, yelled Connie. Chocolate was inside the yard looking through the picture window. <laughs> Doc jumped up. This was dangerous. Chocolate didn't know about glass. Mm. didn't know that it's solid and it broken could cut through a versus moose hide. Doc stepped out, waved a broom and yelled, Go on, shoot! Chocolate didn't budge. <laughs> then Connie had an idea. Soon, fearsome wolf howls filled the air. Ow! Ow! Yip, yip, yip! Ow! Chocolate didn't know it was just a recording. In fact, being raised in captivity, he didn't know about wolves. But deep in his moose brain, he just knew that sound meant danger. He slipped back through the fence and disappeared into the trees. At last, Chaka began to explore Trek's free roaming area. The grassy meadows, cool lake, and woodlands. Chaka really liked a puddle-filled wetland that Doc named Moose Marsh. <laughs> Still, something was missing, his own kind. Most of the time, Chalka didn't mind being alone. After all, moose are not herd animals. But being the only moose in the world just didn't seem right. Doc and Connie didn't think it was right either. One bright morning, while Chalka was browsing on wild blackberries, he smelled a special smell moose. It was a female, a Claire. Toddling behind was a young calf, boom boom, watching from their house across the lake. Doc and Connie smiled. Oh, oh my. Let's all go to Northwest Trek now. Yeah. Thank you so much. Carol, beautiful reading. And Connie, I couldn't stop listening. I wanted to know what, what happened next. What a good story. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.